Welcome, everyone. <laughs> so my name is Matthias Krauls. I am an uh, enterprise customer engineer at PlanScale, still at PlanScale, <laughs> which is good. Um, I'll be talking today a bit about MySQL, high availability, how you can do connection handling, connection pooling, things like that. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, so um, if you have questions, please save them for that. And with that, let's get started. So people always ask me, like, is it MySQL or MySQL or whatever? Um, so the official way to pronounce it is MySQL, but we're open for all other suggestions. Uh, this is from the manual. The link is there, so you can see. <laughs> um, today, we're going to give a brief introduction about MySQL. Um, how it came to be that I'm talking here about connections and connection pooling um, because like life is short and why would you talk about connection pooling? <laughs> um, then some challenges uh, about connection management. Uh, then I'm going to go a little bit on how PlanetScale um, supports connections and then at the end we'll have time for questions. So. MySQL is still the top open source database. We're losing traction against Postgres, but um, looking at DB rankings, we're still the biggest one. So founded in 1995, um, um, long time ago, uh, 30 years next year. Um, so uh, yeah. <coughs> um, now currently, Oracle Corporation owns MySQL, and that's been the reason for many of the flame wars around there on the internet. Um, so we'll see how that develops. Um, and current release is still 8.0. That's the, the one you should be using in production. Um, if you're using anything else, anything older, please upgrade. Anything newer, please be careful. <laughs> um, in 2019, it won DBMS of the Year on DB rankings. And it's widely used uh, by top websites in the world. Think Facebook, Twitter, Booking.com, all of those very large web applications are uh, using MySQL. And this is also why um, connection handling and connection pooling is, is kind of important because traffic, web traffic is very unpredictable. Like if you have an application, uh, in-house application, you can pretty much predict how many users you'll have because the amount of employees you have is probably going to be the maximum number of connections. Uh, but if you have a web application like Twitter and someone does something stupid or says something nice, you, you might experience a little spike in connections and in traffic. So. <coughs> um, why did we get so popular? Um, mostly initially because it's uh, free and open source software. Um, it's very easy to install, like my first job, we were using MySQL and uh, all the system engineers were doing was app get install MySQL server. Done, works. <laughs> if you grow a little bit, it becomes a little bit harder to, um, to install and to manage, but still can be done. Um, and it's able to handle a lot of connections. Um, like if you would run Oracle database for the same amount of connections, it costs you an arm and a leg on licensing alone. And so um, MySQL free. And it was very easy in the early days of PHP MySQL to set it up. Like PHP came by default with MySQL connectors enabled. Like if you want to use Postgres back in the day, you'd have to recompile your PHP with all the flags to support it and to be able to connect, which was a big pain in the ass. <coughs> so um, that's why um, MySQL really gained a lot of popularity, and then finally also because uh, replication. Replication, and we're going to go a little bit deeper there. So replication is a way to um, have more copies of your data that you can actually use. Like um, you would always have a single primary uh, where you can write to, but you can have a lot of replicas, like there's three dots here, but you can't see those with the lighting. <laughs> um, you can have a lot of replicas. There's three here, but you can have multiple. Uh, and so you can use all those replicas for uh, rescale out. So you can write to this one server because most of the web traffic 
Like if you think about a website like booking.com, how many hotels do you browse before you book one? Like it's probably gonna be a magnitude of that. Uh, so only the writes need to go there, but all the reads can go to the replicas. Um, the replicas can also be used for uh, high availability and failover. If something happens with your primary, you can say, okay, let's promote a replica to become the new primary and continue operations for like nothing happened. Uh, you can use the replicas for backups, like you don't have to take the primary down for backups, which is um, an easy thing to do. Um, a few replication ways. Traditionally, um, replication was asynchronous, so that means that the primary um, executes your transaction and doesn't care about any of the replicas to be catching it up. So um, at commit time, it would write the transaction to a binary log and then the replica would at its own pace read that binary log and apply it in its local um, data copy. Um, in an ideal world, you keep that um, replication delay, like the replica uh, behind your primary under one second, but um, it can't grow if the, the replica can't keep up. That's why a semi-sync came to be, like um, we want to make sure that at least one replica had received the transaction before um, the primary would uh, continue working or co uh, continue committing the, uh, the transaction. So you would um, have more um, uh, safe, um, uh, like crash safety if, if your primary would crash um, and no, no uh, replicas had, uh, had the transaction received it would have not been committed and so it would uh, not be acknowledged to the, to the client. And then at the end, um, you have synchronous replication. It's virtually synchronous because it can still be behind, but um, in this case, um, the, the cluster solution that you would use uh, would make sure that uh, transactions are synchronized across the cluster, um, but not necessarily all applied there already. <clears throat> so now we come to the point where we talk about connection handling. So MySQL uh, has a thread-based um, architecture as opposed to Postgres where you have a, uh, uh, a process-based uh, connection uh, 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 system. Like if you would look at a, a Linux server's process list on when it's running a Postgres server, you would see all the connections in the, the process list while on MySQL you would just see a MySQL D process and no other processes. But if you then would go look into the threads, you would see one thread per connection um, that, that MySQL uses. So um, that's a good and a bad thing at the same time. Good thing is you have it fully isolated and so the threads can work on their own pace. Uh, the bad thing is that you cannot do multi-threaded transactions like uh, MySQL doesn't support that because of this architecture. Um, so whenever you get a client that tries to connect to MySQL, um, it queues up its connection request in a, in a queue here on the front, and then there's a receiver thread working uh, inside of the server that handles the connection requests that are incoming, and it will see if there's a, a, a thread available in the thread cache, and if there is one, it will take one, it will assign that to the connection, and this is the, the thread that will handle that connection. If there's no thread available in the cache, it will create a new one, um, which is uh, gonna be a bit more expensive, but um, in modern systems, that's, that's not so expensive anymore. It, in older systems, that this was very important to have that thread cache, but nowadays, it's not that big of a thing anymore. And then, in the end here, this is gonna be important. This is uh, what's called a thread object. Um, and that's assigned for each of the user threads. And that thread object is a one-to-one -one mapping with the thread of the, of the user. Um, and that basically holds all the memory that this thread will, will be using. Uh, and so we'll come back to that uh, later, why that is an important thing. Um, by default, and most common example there is uh, PHP. Um, connections are short-lived. So you connect to your database, you do your workload, and at the end you disconnect. 
that's, that's how a shortlist connection works. So you, uh, your client sends a query, sends multiple queries, gets results, but then at the end of the page, it just disconnects. And at the disconnect uh, phase, this thread object gets deallocated. So any memory that this thing got assigned will be freed by the, uh, to the OS by the server. Um, as opposed to long-lived connections where these connections are actually kept indefinitely. And so this thread object also is kept indefinitely um, until the connection is actually closed or recycled. This thread object will be there and will be um, keeping memory. So if you have a large thread object, you can have a large number of memory and you can get OM uh, issues with that. Um, so, in an ideal world, the threads just keep going forever. Unfortunately, CPU threads are still limited, like there's no unlimited number of threads that you can have. Um, and so it's based, basically the OS that will decide when a thread gets time to spend on the CPU. Like it's the, the, the CPU's time shared. Um, so they need to wait until, they, until it's their turn. Um, then there's a few things it can wait for, like uh, mutexes is, is one of the important things in the database. Like if you have, if something has to make a change to the internal structures in the database, um, a mutex will be requested and hopefully at some point granted. Um, so that means that um, during the wait for the mutex to be granted, the thread is actually blocked. Um, <coughs> and once the mutex is granted, other threads that will be waiting for that similar, same mutex will, will be waiting on this thread to finish its work. So that's also uh, one thing. And then another typical thing in database world is uh, locking. Um, it's important to, um, to be able to, to lock the records in the data um, when changes are being made so, in, so you don't um, override each other's changes. Um, there's uh, data locks um, when you do uh, insert, update, deletes. There's meta, metadata locks when you need to do DDL changes like uh, alt, create, alt, or drop. And then finally, there's also um, IO uh, things that might uh, you might have to wait for. Like um, uh, a disk is a typical example, but a network connection um, uh, is also something you might want to wait for, or have to wait for. <coughs> uh, nowadays with SSDs, disks are better, performance is better, um, but um, still there's a limited throughput uh, to those, so uh, it's always going to be um, uh, a, th a, a thing to, to, be, to consider, so. And then um, memory allocation is another challenge that uh, we have, have already touched upon briefly. Um, so the threat object holds per connection buffers. Um, uh, Short-lived connections can have a lot of overhead of allocating, deallocating memory, um, uh, all of those things, but then um, long-lived connections can also have uh, big memory pressure. So if you have a lot of long-lived connections, then um, uh, the memory can, the memory hogging can, can, can grow and um, you, you might wanna, um, you might run into memory issues there. Um, and then finally, another challenge uh, with connections is service discovery. So we've talked about replication um, and, but you have to know where the primary is. So if your application needs to connect there, you have to know where it is. If you want to use the replicas for read scale out, you have to know which replicas are available, where they are, how to connect to them, all of those things. There's a few common techniques, um, like people, I've seen people using DNS records for uh, making, uh, uh, making sure where the primary is or a floating IP address like that you can move across different servers. Um, for replicas, you can just, uh, load balance between a pool of replicas, but uh, you have to also then need 
to monitor which replicas are lagging behind, which replicas are currently in use for like taking a backup, uh, things like that. So that's also a big, big thing. Uh, so this is where um, uh, connection pooling can, can definitely help. Um, connection pool is typically an application uh, sit, that's sitting in the middle between your, um, app, your application and your database. And um, it basically holds a number of connections. So if you're using uh, Java, like a Tomcat server or Rails, um, that typically creates a number of connections when it starts up. Um, and when your application then needs a database connection, it basically requests to the connection pool like, hey, I need a, a connection. Um, and um, then the pool will say, hey, I, this is a connection I have available, or I will make a new connection for you. Um, and basically, by doing connection pooling, you make a short-lived connection become a long-lived connection, because it, once your work is done, your application will return the connection to the pool and uh, not disconnect. And the pool will then handle the things like, hey, do I need to recycle memory? Do I want to close this connection or not? That's all up to the, the pool. And sometimes, um, like in, if you come from a PHP background like myself, um, connection pooling wasn't a real thing there back in the day. And so you, ha you had to use an external application. And this is where proxy SQL as an application is something that's very useful. So what is proxy SQL? It's a high performance proxy that sits between your uh, MySQL database and your application. And it's designed from the ground up to speak the MySQL protocol. So um, it can provide uh, load balancing between um, uh, connection, uh, between the, the different servers. And it understands the topology. Like if you uh, send a query uh, and you say, I want this to be, to go to a reader, then Proxy SQL can know that from looking at the query or from uh, whatever you, you tell it to. Um, it knows whether it can, uh, an instance on the back end is up or down. Um, it can be configured as a connection pooling application. So by default, um, Proxy SQL will keep 10% of the connections um, to the back end alive. Um, so if you don't make any other um, configurations and you just install Proxy SQL, it will act as a connection pool on its own. Um, and it has full end-to-end -end SSL support, which is uh, very useful. Like if you have an old legacy application that you still need to connect to a database, but uh, the SSL handshake and overhead for doing that in a, in a PHP application, for example, is, is too big. You could set up Proxy SQL in the middle um, to accept the unencrypted connections locally and then connect safely and securely towards the database. And this is the use case we currently use it most for at planet scale. Um, if we have uh, customers that, that don't have the SSL support currently available yet, we put Proxy SQL in the middle uh, to, to handle that for them. So we keep the Proxy SQL on their side of the connection so they can over their local network or local socket even connect to Proxy SQL and then um, Proxy SQL handles the encryption that we require um, on the planet scale side. So architecture diagrams for deploying Proxy SQL, this is the, the simplest one. So you have your clients on one side, yeah, there, and then you have the proxy in the middle, and your client just connects to the proxy and the proxy connects to MySQL. It's always recommended to have not one proxy because that becomes your single point of failure. If your proxy dies, then uh, the, the game is done. Uh, so in this case, there's three, but you can scale that as many as you want. Uh, the proxies can talk to each other uh, to share configuration. Um, so if you configure one, the other ones will automatically follow. Um, and then on the back end, you have the MySQL servers. Um, and um, you can see th these are called in proxy SQL world, these are called host groups. Like this one has one server, this has two, this has three. Um, important to know is that if you connect to proxy SQL, it will send your query to only one of the servers in the host group. So 
So if it decides this needs to go to this host group, it only has one choice to send it to. But if, you, if it decides this is the host group it needs to go to, then there's two hosts in this one, but it will send it only to one. So it's not a good solution to for uh, write load balancing because you will be writing to different servers and that will lead to split brain. Um, so that's not, not where you wanna go. So if you want, if you have a, a host group of primary, uh, to, to talk to a primary, it should always be one server in that group. Another very common architecture, um, and this is mostly done in Kubernetes deployments, is you put your proxy SQL where the application is. Like you uh, set it as a sidecar to your application, and then um, the client, the application, can talk locally over the local, um, in, inside Kubernetes networking, or even to the local socket. Um, to connect, and then proxy SQL will handle the connection uh, towards MySQL. And this is what we typically use when, when customers um, have issues with the SSL offloading and stuff like that. So we can put the proxy uh, very close to the application and then uh, connect to MySQL. This is a good architecture, but if you have uh, a, a lot of pods, it's becoming uh, very difficult to keep the proxies in sync. And so then you have the hybrid architecture that you can use. So proxy SQL can, the backend in the proxy SQL can be another proxy SQL server if you want, because they just speak the MySQL protocol. And so in this case, all the uh, proxies here are configured with the same uh, configuration, just these, the, the addresses of these three proxies in the middle. And if this changes on the back end, the only uh, proxy SQL instance that need to be updated are the ones in the middle. Um, and then uh, these ones don't need to, need to change. You don't have to sync them with anything. Only if, if one of those here would change, only then they need to know about it. But this is something that doesn't change that often. So, um, And also because uh, proxy SQL on the client side knows whether a proxy would go down, like if you would need to do upgrades or whatever, you can take one of the proxies here down and these ones will know, oh, this one is unavailable right now, so I won't send traffic to that one. And when it comes back, they say, oh, it's coming back, so I can start using it again for, uh, for sending connections. So that's a, a good thing to have. <coughs> then we come uh, to client scale, like, where I work. Um, <coughs> plan scale is built on Vitesse, and Vitesse is originally developed at YouTube. So this is an application that was cloud native before cloud native existed. Um, the, the, the first release of Vitesse was done uh, just weeks before the first Kubernetes release, and uh, the, the guys at YouTube, which was also a Google uh, company, they um, talked to the Kubernetes team, which were their colleagues, and they were like, so whatever we built here, this is actually ready for whatever you're building. And they were like, yeah, actually it is. So it was a thing before Kubernetes came to be. Um, we currently run a managed service in the cloud. We are currently offering publicly in GCP and AWS. Uh, there's no reason why we couldn't do Azure, um, but there's just not been a demand for it. So if anyone wants. Uh, <laughs> um, we are fully scalable. Uh, we run everything on Kubernetes. Like all our databases are um, running as pods in Kubernetes. Um, Vitesse and VT Org, one of the components of Vitesse, um, provides us with high availability. So if something happens to the primary, um, we can, either let Kubernetes reschedule it to another, to another node and continue working, but we also have like um, a tool, uh, an orchestration tool called VTorg that uh, will detect this and will promote a new primary from one of the replicas in the cluster. And on top of that, this is why it was developed initially at YouTube, it supports sharding. As you might know, YouTube has grown a little bit over the last decades, just a little. And so uh, to keep scaling, um, they quickly realized that they would reach the end of the capacity of the servers they could buy. So they needed to go to a distributed system where they could spread the data over multiple servers. 
And so if it has natively support sharding uh, and thus plan scale also support sharding. <coughs> this is the Vitesse architecture diagram. Um, so all the way on the side here, you have your application servers um, and they connect to something called a load balancer. Like this is something you can roll your own or you can use in, in, in plan scale side, you can, we have our, our custom load balancer that we offer. Uh, and so this is where you choose what you want. If you want to run Vitesse on-premise, you can just put an ELB or a, a TCP load balancer in Google in front of, of these things. And these things are called TT gates. And this is basically our proxy. And so your application connects to VT gate and VT gate will accept MySQL connections and uh, will tell you like, hey, you're talking to, to me as a MySQL server and everything that's behind me, just to your, to your application, just looks like one giant MySQL. But in fact, there might be hundreds of shards with hundreds of MySQLs, but to your application, Vitesse will say, hey, here's a database, talk to it. Um, we run uh, in our Kubernetes clusters uh, next to our MySQL processes, we run a VT tablet. It's a, um, basically a sidecar process. Actually, if you think about it, MySQL is more like the sidecar process to VT tablet because <laughs> but, uh, if you're talking about MySQL, it's, it's easier to think that VT tablet is the sidecar. And there are multiple shards, like multiple, the, the tables are, can be sharded into different MySQL servers. Um, and VTGate um, can know about that uh, because this is all registered in a topology server. We use etcd for that. Um, there are people that use Zookeeper uh, with uh, Vitesse, um, but that's a minority. There's still a few people that use console as topology server, but we're looking to deprecate that in the future. Um, and then uh, you have things like VTCTLD, which is the control plane um, to control all of the, the things here. Um, so if you would like to add a new tablet, you tell VTCTLD like add tablet and then it will update the topology server and make sure that VTGate knows about it and all those things. Um, VTORC is what I told you about, is another block that should be here, but I couldn't find the image uh, of it, so I left it there. <coughs> Uh, and then on the back end here, you have uh, MySQL, um, which is basically still the, the main storage. Um, our connection pool um, is not situated on VT gate level, but it's connect, uh, situated on the VT tablet level. Um, VT tablet keeps connections to MySQL open, and the connections between VT gate and VT tablet, they're basically uh, gRPC HTTP requests. Uh, so, um, that is very much more, very, very much easier to handle than, than keeping my SQL connections open. Uh, HTTP scales a little bit better. Um, so. <coughs> then on plan scale, we added uh, our own edge infrastructure on, on the load balancer side. And our edge infrastructure is, is a little bit similar to what you would ha get when you use AWS edge locations. Um, if you have an S3 bucket and you want to serve that from a local area, uh, you can have an edge location uh, that caches basically your connection. Uh, what we do is we uh, terminate your MySQL request uh, on the closest edge that we have. Like if you connect from LA, uh, you will be terminated in a US West 2 region um, to, to make sure that, that you have the lowest possible latency and then edge will figure out where your cluster is and will connect you over the AWS or GCP backbone um, to, um, to your actual database. So uh, to, to have the lowest possible latency, that's a, a, a good thing. And also uh, Edge supports HTTPS uh, endpoints, gRPC uh, connections. So if you don't wanna use the MySQL protocol, 
to talk to by SQL, but you want to use like HTTP connections, uh, you can. So that's supported by Edge. Um, and that's actually also the initial use case for VTGate. Like initially at YouTube, VTGate, um, uh, the, the applications talked gRPC to VTGate and the MySQL protocol in VTGate is actually something that came later in the second phase because we like, we offer a MySQL service, so we should potentially also be offering the MySQL protocol. Um, and uh, so that's then what it looks like in uh, the global routing infrastructure. So you have the edge uh, at the closest uh, place you want, and then you have the databases. So the VT gates are the, um, the proxies, and then you have your databases on the back end. So whatever, uh, wherever you come into, you can be routed to the right database in VT gate um, as you need to. And then we have a blog post where we took this glove uh, to get it to 1 million connections. It's, and we got there. So if you want to read about how we did that, there's a blog post there. But any questions? Um, that depends on how you configure them. Like if you, if you use the proxy SQL clustering mechanism, um, I wouldn't go over hundreds. Um, but if you have a way that you can um, uh, distribute the configuration for those proxies in a better way than, than letting them figure it out among them, amongst themselves, you could go to thousands. Like if they, if they don't have to rely on it on talking to each other, it's uh, I, I I know Proxy SQL was originally developed at Dropbox, and they also have quite a lot of connections, so it was it, it's able to scale quite significantly there. They go through there, yeah. So uh, what what you do, let me go to the slide, um, ba, 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 there we go. Um, so basically, um, the reason you put these here is because this is more volatile um, on, the, on the MySQL side. Like if there's a, a, a failure on your MySQL end, uh, you need to promote a new primary uh, or you need to re recreate a new replica. And then Proxy SQL needs to know about that. And if you have thousands of Proxy SQLs to update, it's gonna take a while. Yeah, I guess theoretically it would be feasible that if you were new to Proxy SQL, you could go through even a few weeks long cycles of tweaking your style while they get a full package to the next level, is that right? Yeah. So you're not telling them to stop using Proxy SQL, it's just not gonna work. Yeah, the, the, the easy part here is that it's just monitoring the, the health of the, the proxy here. So if one of these proxies goes down for the upgrade or for whatever reason, um, it just stops sending traffic there. So it's only doing a ping, like, are you alive or not? Uh, whereas if, if you have to update the configuration, it has to be synced and it has to be stored. And so. Other questions?
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, proxy SQL performance is really good for that. Like, uh, it uh, really helps. It's basically speaking the MySQL protocol. Yeah. Yeah. It, it basically does whatever you're doing now. It, it's also implementing the C library for MySQL clients. Well, it's using, I think, the MariaDB library still uh, internally. But yeah, same potato, potato. <laughs> Anyone else? Then we could all go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs>